if you're doing platform engineering, well, maybe, maybe not. If And because engineering is a science, we not only want to define what platform engineering is to let everyone know about it, but we also want to measure it because how else are we going to improve, whether you're talking about agile, DevOps, or platform engineering, it's all about continuous improvement and maybe experimentation on your colleagues. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the stage. I hope I pronounced your names right. I asked uh, for you for the pronunciation of all your, of, of all of your names uh, earlier. So I hope I got them right. I'm really eager to listen to your panel, um, which is about measuring the impact of uh, tooling, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's about measuring the impact of your platform engineering journey, for sure. Cool. Um, I hope it will be great as it will be for me. I really, I'm really eager to listen to what you have to say. So I will leave the stage to you and please go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Uh, yeah. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. Uh, this is a really important topic platform, everyone has platforms. There's no doubt about that. But if you're doing platform engineering, well, maybe, maybe not. If And because engineering is a science, we not only want to define what platform engineering is to let everyone know about it, but we also want to measure it because how else are we going to improve, whether you're talking about agile, DevOps, or platform engineering. It's all about continuous improvement and maybe experimentation on your colleagues. So welcome everyone. I cannot stress how we have a uniquely qualified group to answer what is platform engineering and how do you measure it. Uh, I will just let you introduce yourselves. And as you introduce yourselves, can you give some background into your world of platform engineering? So Abby, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Abby Bangzer. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am a co-lead of the Platforms Working Group within the CNCF. So thank you, Claudio, for the call out there. It's it's really great to be a part of the community there. And before I share what I do now, I'll share my background. So I have always been in sort of internal optimization and support. I started in QA, went to kind of DevOps and, and platform engineering. It's always been about how to support engineers at my organization be more effective and and uh, more productive on the team. And so I always found platform engineering quite hard when I was a platform engineer. And so my current role is to try and make that easier because I think the tooling out there makes it hard. And so I'm currently a principal engineer at Sintasso, building a framework to try and help platform engineers make their platforms. OK, Anna. Yeah. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm Anna Chua. I up till uh, the summer I used to work for Red Hat uh, in the Open Innovation Labs. So my focus there was working on the teams that were about to adopt the ways of uh, using platforms, uh, our platforms, and working with them uh, to improve the um, advantage they could get from using those platforms. So it was not just so much about importing tech, but also ways of working. Uh, uh, learning how uh, how we use that in the open source world and, and and so on, and one of the topics that we were really focused on was uh, working using the convincing them to start working um, with the platform as a product frames and and learning in them how to use that product management approach and and so on to the platform. So that's what I've been doing for the last four to five years, and I will now pass to Alexandra. Hey everyone, I'm Alex. Uh... As Abby, before sharing what I'm doing now, I'll talk a bit about my background. Uh, so I've been a platform product manager for four and a half years now. Um, I've worked uh, for startups and government in the same space, and it's always been super interesting for me to see how different companies approach platform as a product. It's really been a wild journey. 
Uh, I'm a senior product manager now at ZOA for the platform group, um, and we work with energy companies to stop climate change, which is as exciting as humbling. Um, yeah, so really enjoy it. Helen? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Helen Greel. I lead engineering for Backstage Developer Platform within Developer Experience Unit at Spotify recently. Similar to Abby, my background is in quality engineering, quality assurance. So I spent uh, a lot of time in my pr prior years, like empowering uh, internal teams to go faster through platform engineering, uh, through internal tools, observability, that type of stuff. And uh, I've done that in like multiple different domains from healthcare to finance and to recently content at Spotify. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, for platform engineering to become such a trend and uh, for like, uh, multiple companies becoming so aware of like how platform engineering feeds into developer experience. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. And I'm going to pass the baton over to Jen. <laughs> yes, it's a good way to remind me to actually introduce myself. I'm Jen Riggins. I am a tech journalist. Until 2023, I'm like a lot of the people in the audience where I had not heard of platform engineering, but I write about the culture side of tech and developer productivity is a huge driver this year. And also we know productivity is through helping developers work happier. Not sure if that went backwards or forwards, but that's one of the slogans of my co-working. So it worked out well today with my morning tea, which I'm sure y'all are having coffee or tea this morning. I'm really excited to have this conversation because it's pivoting what it used to be. It used to be more about command and control. And yes, we do have tighter budgets and we are trying to get more out of fewer people on more complex technology. But it seems like while we are reversing the trends over the last couple of years in a lot of ways, sadly, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, is, this is not representative of the tech industry as a whole. Um, this wonderful, esteemed and wildly experienced panel doing platform engineering before it was even probably a name and working with platform teams before it was probably even the name platform engineering. But one thing that I think as an industry we've coalesced around and realized is that we have to listen to our developers. It's not easy. We think we know better. But in order to continuously improve their lives and improve what they are bringing out as an industry, I think we've agreed. Maybe there are certain consultancies, big, big consultancies that think they should be spending all their time coding, but we're trying, we're here to discuss how value added should come out. So just to give everyone as a journalist, a baseline definition, what is platform engineering? I kind of love Abby's first, so. That's the one I've stolen. Uh, so I think that's a harken back to, I at one point said uh, that platform engineering is the is doing the non-differentiated but still highly valuable work um, in as kind of productive and um, shared way as possible in the organization. I think that's for platforms, right? Platforms are about holding people up, letting people work at a higher level of abstraction. And that's what we're trying to build. I think with platform engineering, that is the practice of building those platforms. And it's really just another discipline within software engineering. It requires people, process, technology. It requires uh, discipline around product management and uh, software uh, writing as well. So all, all of that ties together to, to build those uh, common capabilities that people can depend on at their work. Yeah, and to build on what Abby was just saying, um, one additional, I guess, layer to this is like cognitive load and, and the complexity. And to me, what like the definition that really resonates from like developer experience angle is building abstraction layers to shield developers from the complexity of underlying technologies and like use that as a means to reduce cognitive load is, which is getting very real in the industry. Um, so yeah, that's that's my favorite one. 
I think the way I look at it, uh, it's really an internal product that acts as a force multiplier um, for product teams to move faster without actually breaking things, contrary to the Agile manifesto. And there's a very good definition out there by uh, Martin Fowler in his article when I talk when I talk about platform, and he talks about a uh, platform being a foundation of self-service APIs, um, knowledge, support, all arranged as a compelling internal product, which I think it's an important distinction as well. I know what, what distinguishes the platform engineering from platform as a product. Um, so I guess the platform as a product is adding the layer of uh, ownership. That's one of the things that's really important in the world of product, because in the past there was lots of projects, projects on little things here and there. And having that one person overlooking what's happening in the whole internal product and being responsible for it because it's a baby and is making sure that that baby evolves with time, that it serves its purpose, that it's known by others. It's, it's basically the primary job of, of the product manager. And, and, and I, I think it, that adds up to everything that, they, that you guys said. What makes it different from other products you measure, Anna? Um, the fact that it's different is that it's an internal product and we don't really make money selling it, but we can still find the ways to understand how much it is costing us and how much we are making saving thanks to that. And that, I guess that's something that we can probably elaborate on a little bit more um, uh, in, in, in this panel, because I did hear some people asking like, how is that a product? That there's no price on the platform. Uh, so um, I wonder if that's if that's a good segue to the to the to the to the next topic you, you had prepared about uh, the metrics. What do we measure about the platform? Yeah, and also I would say while it doesn't have a specific amount of money you're paying for, certainly retention is very expensive and recruitment. So if you don't have happy developers, they don't retain. Alex, uniquely qualified in your role in product <laughs> for this, I think. Um, I think I definitely agree with uh, with Anna's definition of being an internal product. And if you look at the way people uh, approached internal products in the past with build the day and they'll come mentality, that's very detrimental for the organization. And sort of I go back to my original definition, you have to look at it as a force multiplier for your business. Uh, everything starts with having a really good foundation, a really good internal product. And to use an analogy, I don't think anyone would build uh, their house on a very shaky foundation, right? No one will build their organization on shaky internal products, right? You want to have a really good um, good foundation. That's true. I think I've been in the position not of a product manager for platforms before, so I, I love hearing you two who have that depth of experience. I've actually been on the other side of that and been interviewing product managers for platform teams before. And one thing I found really interesting is the, uh, the difference in the the audience for your product. Our product is a captive audience. We talk about having it be optional, but at the end of the day, you have a set group of humans that are potentially gonna be using your product. Uh, and it's a smaller audience. Realistically, you're looking at most thousands and maybe tens or hundreds is more, more realistic for your org. Um, and so I've had a product manager come in and talk to me about A-B testing as a way to validate their internal platform. And I've thought to myself, that is a fantastic product management technique for learning about uh, potential new features, but I'm not sure this is the this is the, the type of product that that would work best for. So I think keeping in mind uh, that captive smaller audience, it's going to mean that certain tools in your toolbox as a product manager are going to be less effective than others, I think. Okay, and it's probably easier, it should be easier because it is a tighter feedback loop. You can talk, you can literally go in the Slack and ask some questions or sadly for companies that forced to return to office, go sit by them and bug them when they really don't wanna be distracted in the office. Um, but that doesn't mean that platform engineers don't think they know better because they're engineers maybe? So let's put in context of your own organizations. How are you measuring the impact on the product and company in your own organizations? Because not only are some of you working in platform engineering or building platform tools or consulting platform teams, some of you are doing it with inside. Helen, let's talk Spotify, I think. <laughs> 
Sure. Yeah, I mean, let me start with maybe introducing the mental model of how we think about metrics in first place. Uh, so to us, metrics are put on scale, uh, with some of them being leading and some of them being lagging. Um, and this is due to the fact that like metrics are products too, internal products, but still products. And they require iterations and they have bugs and they have complexities and we have to deal with them. Um, and metrics, which like I'm deeply convinced that metrics uh, that are both like value focused and actionable by teams, they don't exist. So what we do instead, just to give you a couple of examples of like leading versus lagging. So leading are usually like more action focused, more noisy, more actionable, but more tactical. And you can also game them pretty quickly. So that's also like a question about incentives. And the lagging uh, metrics, which are like important strategic metrics to me, are more value impact focused, but also like it's hard to measure them precisely. So it's more like around making bats and connecting the right leading metrics to the lagging ones. Um, and they're tricky to measure too. So the way like we think about them is more of like a graph where you make a bat of like improving certain part of the user experience or developer experience in that case. And you connect actionable metrics like build times, like flaky tasks, all that type of stuff. And then you see what's going to happen there, basically. Uh, so like, TLDR is that uh, leading influence lagging, and the graph of that influence is basically the company alignment or the department alignment. And it will evolve over time as like we sort of try and see and, and learn. Uh, and yeah, when I'm being asked, like, when is the good time to start? Like, best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Second best time is today. Uh, so same with metrics. Like, uh, it's never too late to start. It's always a good time. Um, and a really good way to start to me is, like, maybe surveys or qualitative, uh, basically, conversation with your developers. It doesn't have to be a survey, but, like, you need to ask what they think about it. Um, so yeah, sorry, maybe long-winded way of like saying this, but that's that's how we think about measuring uh, platforms and success of platforms in general. And offering them free food even remotely is a good way to motivate them to sit down and really focus on that conversation. <laughs> Abby, what about at okay. your organization? How are you measuring or at previous orgs? Yeah, so uh, at previous organizations, we would try and put metrics around behaviors that we that that developers did quite frequently. So these would be things around starting up new services or uh, delivering to production, things like that. And then once we had measurements of what current was, we would be able to track progress on that. We would track being able to improve that. And that was the outcomes that we wanted to move. So it didn't matter what else was happening with our platform if those outcomes improved. I think the interesting part about where I am today, which is helping build a framework for platform engineers to then build those uh, capabilities and, and support their their application devs, it's like a layer, layer below, um, is that what we're trying to do is uh, give people the tools that they need to be able to build those metrics in. So how do you build in monitoring, as Helen said, from day one, ideally, um, right away from the beginning? and do so in a con kind of consistent way, something that you can keep tracking as you go. And I think that's important, whatever tools you use in platform engineering, that they're built for that feedback loop and built for being able to, uh, to, to track progress. Alex? We, I think we do, a, we do a similar thing to, to what you just described, Abby, but um, we've got a really good uh, internal team of senior engineering managers. So we work together to have this North Star metric of engineering speed. But context is really important for us, right? So we start defining what engineering speed means for us and why we're actually, why we plan to measure those things, because I think it's really important. And, you know, I don't know if this is me being a PM, but context is king all the time. So you want to tell your developers, you know, we're going after these metrics because these are important for us. We want to measure the speed in which we're delivering value to our customers, because that's really important and it's a really important metric to have. But it's not sort of like related to measuring lines of code and like how, you know, um, the performance of the engineers. So I think it's really important to put context uh, context behind uh, behind the metrics as well. 
Absolutely. Just to say, when I talk about like delivery speed and things like that, most of the time, that's the thing that our users were clamoring for <laughs> when we were yeah. when we were measuring that because they were frustrated by the fact that they couldn't couldn't see feedback loops for their own code. So this wasn't about pushing them to move faster. It was about that they were feeling uh, limitations because of the speed at which we could get things into production and how do we improve that. So, but yeah, to, to your point, Alex, it's definitely context and it's definitely needs to be something that is viewed as a uh, supporter rather than something that is viewed as a an oversight or uh, totally, you know, negative yeah. thing in that way. They want to get involved. Anna? So my profile is actually mostly working with the teams at the beginning of the journey. So maturity is quite low. So at that stage, we try to get them put into the uh, thinking about all kind of metrics, because as one of you, I think Helen said, a metric itself is a product. You need to experiment with them to figure out which, to, which one is actually working for you. Uh, so we obviously t uh, talk about uh, metrics for the products, so all the software delivery metrics, right? Dola metrics, how quickly it takes you to release yet another service, how quickly you recover and uh, f from the failure, how, uh, how quickly you recover from the bug, etc. But then we also focus on things like adoption. How quickly does it take you to onboard the next team to be able to make use of your platform? Things like um, how many workloads are currently uh, work running on your platform, how many workloads it can support, uh, things about scalability and, and so on. And then uh, we also think about items like how is your platform helping your business? Like does it take, uh, 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 does it impact time to market for, for other teams and, and so on? So, so that business impact. Uh, so it, it really depends on the circumstances. It depends on what the teams we are working with are capable of putting together where, where they are coming from. But we're trying to, to kind of uh, pick little metrics from everywhere to make them aware that it's not just one uh, direction they should be looking at. It, it really impacts multiple items and, and they need to have a good mix of this and that to, to be able to understand whether the product is working well. So let's build up from there, because I think that's a good point. Um, we did at the Open UK meetup last week, we did a platform engineering panel, and we quickly learned a lot of the audience was very nascent or very beginner in their understanding of the idea of platform engineering, let alone implementing a program. So let's build up, and then we can build up from there. So if you're getting started, what are some quantitative or qualitative and let's try to group them maybe maybe there's a gray area i don't think so though in those i don't do math but what are some early metrics maybe when you're just starting to ideate the idea of a platform engineering program that you can gather maybe from the existing tooling you already have what would be some quick ones there and then together with the group you know get people together and ask them qualitative questions. So what are some good quantitative kickoffs thrown out to the group? I can throw out one. Um, there's an old XKCD uh, drawing that tries to talk about when you should automate something. And if something takes you one second to do and you do it once a month, but it's going to take you a week to automate it, it doesn't make any sense to automate it. And it's the idea of that you should be using automation to improve your life, improve the things that happen frequently and take a large toll on you and not just automate because it's fun to write code. Although it is fun and you can do those side projects at home if you'd like. Um, and so I think that that's something that I would like, encourage people to do quite quite early in their journey is figure out where, where it are frequent tasks that are common across the organization that are being done and repetitive and um, duplicated and, and how much time and pressure do those things take? So I'll kick off with, with that as a way to be able to do measurements. I, th I think for me, time to onboard still remains a classic uh, or like time for developers to like either use documentation or tooling, uh, put sort of everything under time to onboard umbrella, because I think it's really important for you to understand exactly how much time they're spending um, in that process and in that journey and where are the opportunities for improvement and where the friction is. And I think that's really a really good uh, place to start in your journey. And I think one that brings together both of your thoughts is the time to value, because it, it actually brings, brings together all the aspects and, and the areas there 
where we are wasting the most of the time on, on the handoffs and uh, that could be automated is probably where we should be starting. And I'm going to beat the drum of cognitive load again, uh, just because I'm a big fan of making developers' life easier. Uh, so time to time spent looking for things is uh, a lot of what we measure. Uh, or time to get unstuck is another variation of that, uh, because you can easily like pinpoint the the time sinks in your organization. Like where do you see those points of like congestion and friction where people are like looking for stuff but not being able to find it would be a really good measure to just like round this up uh, all the good suggestions from uh ladies yes the numbers i was trying to find it while we were doing uh, but the numbers of times people are spending looking for stuff is something that a lot of teams aren't measuring but are astounding i think stack overflow had like an hour a day or more people are, and that's a huge, that adds up monetarily. So, and then quant qualitatively, what are the questions you should be asking your developers early on and throughout that maybe what's their greatest frustration? Uh, another one from Abby's colleague, Paula at Centasso, she said, just look through JIRA tickets, try to find some common patterns because they they may all be very frustrated by JIRA at times, but they're all putting their complaints on there. So you may find some common patterns that way, but what are some questions that you should be asking? You're probably, if you're talking about platform engineering program, overloaded developers. I personally really like uh, satisfaction questions, like how satisfied are you with our tooling on a scale from like one to five, or how satisfied are you with the quality of our docs on a scale from one to five? How satisfied are you with the process? So I really like uh, that uh, those types of questions. I do too, and I, I would like to add the one about the magic wand. If you have magic wand, what would be one thing you would change about our platform right now? Because that, that's something like, uh, you, it can give you some simple, easy idea that can improve the satisfaction very quickly if, if you get a lot of people saying about the same thing. So early in the day, that can be quite helpful. Yeah, I'll add to that. What is the thing that worries you the most? I think that we talk a lot about uh, developer satisfaction in the sense of like, do we have a foosball table at the office style? Uh, are people happy? Are people, uh, you know, treated in some sort of a that way. But I think a lot of satisfaction comes from trusting in the processes, trusting that security is being built in, trusting that performance is being built in. Um, so if people are worried every day as they're developing about security risks and they don't feel like they have the right support systems, that'd be something I'd want to hear about. So what worries you the most as you develop? Totally. Yeah, what we do at Spotify, uh, we have like a bi-yearly, bi yearly, uh, biannually, I guess, engineering satisfaction survey that takes like a diverse group of uh, people from all different disciplines, all kinds of tenure, like from like real old timers to new joiners. And we survey them on four main pillars of developer satisfaction, which is productivity, blockers, tasks and tools. And some of those questions are more like reflective as in like, yeah, what would you do to improve X? And some are more like future looking, like if you had a magic wand, what would you do? And it's really amazing what you see uh, come back in like in self-reported or perceived productivity, uh, as well as like free text comments. I really love free text comments because like these are really golden, like you get a lot of great ideas and inspiration from those. So can totally recommend. One thing that Abby mentioned made me uh, reminded me about really important metric that we can be collecting at the very beginning is a trust, but not just of the developers, because we are building the platforms for developers with developers, but that we, we've got influencers in the organization, the security teams, uh, the leadership teams, and so on. So understanding their trust into our product can be really key. To, uh, to make sure that we are going in, in the right direction. So that's really important to be somewhere there at the beginning of the platform journey. And how do you measure trust? It feels very esoteric. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, 
it would be go, uh, going down to the to the conversations, little surveys, like sometimes like where where do you feel we uh, we are on this platform journey? Do you completely trust it? What, what, and then uh, and then you can uh, you can build on that. At, at this early stage, probably you interviews with those people are uh, are giving you the the most points. So I, I guess it's a it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative things. So you, you can do like first of survey with numbers and and then build on the and the results of that survey by exploring a little bit more. What you're describing a lot of is product, a product situation where you're going through user research, early customers, trying to get early adopters that will be brand advocates. This is basic marketing and sales, but maybe not something the average computer science graduate is learning or even boot camp graduate. Uh, we have a question from the audience. And thank you, Stefan, for that. And any idea how to measure time to discover? Because discoverability is a huge part of platform engineering. And he continues, when hunting for information, people start with X, but end up finding it's Y. How do you connect the dots? Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> I can jump in potentially. Uh, so yeah, we uh, we measure this through like click click rate to success. Basically, um, there is like an internal search, and perhaps like a lot of companies have some kind of internal search, internal index type of capability, and like the most like the the, the basic metric that uh, is really easy to measure would be like how many clicks does it take for you to land on something that was useful. Uh, so that's uh, like our I guess basic measure there, and like it gets more granular, it gets more complicated, but basically like how many clicks did it take you to get to the uh, search results you wanted to get to. But that's, uh, let me clarify, that's searchability. The other thing is like discoverability, which is more by accident. Like sometimes you don't know what you don't know and you don't know the, the type of information that might be beneficial for you. Um, so that's more like how to surface the right information for a user based on their role, potentially based on their context. Uh, so maybe they don't like even know that exists in the in their organization, but that's, I guess, more, more of a sophisticated problem to solve. Searchability is easier to kind of start measuring uh, through the click rate. When you say click rate, are you measuring developers' clicks through a mechanical way, or are you asking developers to click? Are you observing some developers use of it logistically how does that even work yeah it's done through google analytics basically and like supposedly you uh you click like you you run search you click and then like if you spend less than like this amount x amount of seconds or milliseconds on a page, then we can make an assumption if it was successful or not. Like supposedly if you found something that you were looking for, you would stay on that page for longer because you would need to read this. And if you just like quickly like skim through it, that's probably like wasn't super useful. And also like the, the next search that comes after that, like if you continue running, like refining your search term and running search after search, then you're probably still looking. Uh, so yeah, some of the basic assumptions there. Very interesting. What you're talking about is taking skill sets cross organizational, cross functional, including from like marketing. So that's very interesting. Alex, how do you want to build on that? Um, I think it also depends on the size of the organization. First of all, it's such a good question, actually. Um, so, yeah, congratulations for that. Um, I did two things, actually. But I think these are more proxy uh, metrics rather than actually uh, actual metrics. So, one, the majority of the of the documentation tools right now have, like, analytics. So, I tend to browse through our sort of internal documentation analytics all the time and see how people are engaging with our, uh, with our docs. And then the second uh, way I try to do this, usually when people can't find something, uh, they ping uh, a request of help to, to the internal developer platform team. And so I tend to look at how much time it's taking us to, to solve that request and uh, how much time it took that engineer to find the information. But these are all proxy and anecdotally rather than what sort of like Helen described, which is why I think it's also depending on the size of the organization. Really good question again. Yeah, it's really good. And Stefan actually brought a follow-up. So that's really good because 
platform teams have the same problem as developers, that there's so many disparate tools. And there are really good tools that do things really well, like companies stop building their own payment platforms because Stripe is so good. And there's a lot of stuff, but they are disparate. So what if you don't have a single search? E.g., we all use tools, Notions, Tech Docs, Google Docs, Jira, and Slack. So information is kind of all over the place. So how do you do that? How do you bring them all together, Helen, first? Yeah, so the magic, at least like the way we see it, is in combination of like quantitative versus qualitative information. The analytics approach that uh, I was describing definitely doesn't cover all of the sources that like one might be searching through. Uh, so what we do is we ask like all those same questions in the engineering survey, like how long does it take you to get unstuck? Typically, like what takes you out of flow? Like how much time roughly do you spend on X, Y, and Z? Uh, because for instance, like Slack, Jira, like we have a fair amount of, of tools that are indexed behind the Google Cloud search, but not all of those potential sources. So things like Jira, Slack, it's really hard to measure how much time people spend there. Uh, so we do that by asking, actually asking people like what's useful, what's not, how much time roughly uh, do you spend on, on um yeah, on finding information. And then basically the intersection of qualitative and quantitative gives you the most actionable next steps and like pinpoints, points of friction. Um, but yeah, that just works for us. So while everyone on this panel besides me has been in the platform space for years, it's kind of come to head in 2023. And again, that's we've gone through a lot of layoffs over the last year and on the other end, the cloud native landscape is, it doesn't fit on two screens anymore. You need to be at least a three screen user to see it all. And I'm sure there are some of those on the call. So with that in mind, developer productivity, dun, dun, dun. I don't think anyone on the call, I'm gonna jump ahead and say, no one on the call is agreeing with the McKinsey framework. So don't read that. You can read my article about that on Lean Dev. Um, Productivity, we are not defining as lines of code or time spent coding necessarily. So what is developer productivity and how do you measure it? Abby, you seem my, to be not. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. So my my favorite kind of responses to that, to that article and that framework is around how it's a, a measurement of teams at the end of the day. Are the teams being productive? Are the teams delivering value? And I think there are a lot of frameworks out there that talk about, I think Anna did a call to, to time to value earlier. What developer productivity is, is how long does it take from getting feedback, whether that be through a, hypo a brand new idea hypothesis that was generated by the organization or feedback from a user asking for something or being frustrated by something, how long does it take for the team to be able to deliver the next iteration on that? And I think that takes a lot of focus away from things like lines of code and even things like speed of your CI CD delivery pipelines, right? That will be a part of it. But that whole phase of, wait, tell me more about what your problem is. Tell me more about what your hopes and your goals are for this uh, ideation phase and that whole prototyping phase and that whole figuring out what to build phase is part of that time to value. And I just want to make it clear because I think that you've mentioned that that's sometimes not a skill that's been taught at uni for people uh, in platform engineering, so possibly in software engineering as a whole. Ju wanting to do prototyping, wanting to do discovery on a problem does not have to be days, weeks, months of a professionally trained person on those skill sets. This is just take out a post-it note, sketch something down and be like, is this vaguely what you were talking about? Okay, cool. And you can move on. Uh, if if you got it right, right, or else that might uncover something else. So I think what I look what I would like to look at is teams the team's ability to deliver value and and how long that might take. Okay, Helen, you're nodding along, and then Anna. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say it better, honestly. Uh, Abby just uh, 
crash tits. Yeah, so that's that's a lot of like I, that resonates a lot, and that's how we measure uh, developer productivity as well. Like it's mostly around developer journeys, optimizing certain parts within developer journeys, and like overall time to value. So yeah, plus one hundred from, from my end. I, or squad journey, I guess at Spotify. Anna, if people are just getting started, what should be they be trying to measure in developer productivity? So definitely what Abby said, but I also have to continue drumming for Helen in the space of cognitive load, because when we are starting the journey, we can see like how many blockers are being thrown under the feet of developer, under the feet of developer, with all the stupid, uh, if all, with all the forms, uh, the different tickets, and and so on. We we need to feel so ultimately the best measure of like uh, platform making it easy for developers to be productive is for the platform to ultimately becoming self-service, that they, they can have frictionless uh, interactions with the platform, that they do not need to waste time on any additional admin or anything. They just want this, they click it, they get it. So that's the nirvana. And, and then one of the things we, we can measure is how far away we are from the nirvana and what will uh, take us to get there. So that, that, that's, that's just the elaboration of what Abby already said. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, we've talked, we've mentioned layoffs and all. One of the areas that there have been layoffs in the last year are platform teams. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be a platform engineer. We need more. But if you are not able to connect what is another cost center in the largest cost center at most companies, which is engineering staff, if you're not able to connect that to business, you are at risk. If you can't prove, because a lot of these are really early on, like Anna said, a lot of these organizations are early in their platform journey. If they can't prove wins pretty soon after, they may be cut because companies just aren't investing as strategically in their staff as they should be right now. So one of the wonderful things about platform engineering is it creates a kind of a translation between business and engineering. So business starts to understand what engineering is up to because again, spendy and engineers start to have this connection to business value more and how they're driving it. So that's a wonderful benefit. So how, Alex, how do you measure business impact on a platform engineering team? I think this uh, is probably one of the hardest uh, things of being a platform product manage manager and it's still something that uh, challenges me pretty much all the time uh, and has been in all of my roles because it's not you don't have a direct link to say oh this is how much money we brought into the organization and this is like what we you know we've been able to to, to do or enable for the org. But in saying that, you look at the goals or the metrics the organization have. Usually if it's a SaaS business, you look at lifetime to value, cost acquisition, monthly active users, and then you try to find uh, uh, some proxies to that as well. I think one metric that is often overlooked if you look at cost of acquisition uh, for the customers is exactly how much uh, we're spending for the infrastructure and the tooling to acquire that specific customer or like how much we're spending to sort of like maintain that specific customer. And I think cost optimization is a metric that isn't talked enough when talking about business impact, because I think ultimately that's where you can demonstrate the most amount of value. And then secondly, I think building on the cognitive load, uh, which is an area that I'm super passionate about. I think if you are able to measure that, you then are able to demonstrate that you can free up time or for R&D purposes, um, where you can like get your engineers to work on more exciting stuff, stuff that can actually drive the organization forward. And ultimately, I'll go back to engineering speed because it's all about the speed in which you're delivering value to the customers. If it takes you three or four days to put a PR in production or three to four days to deliver something to the customer, then you know maybe that's a problem and there's something for, for you to solve there. So I think those three are the areas that I constantly go back and really not trying to, to reinvent the wheel. But I also like the space framework. If you look at the space, space framework of measuring developer productivity, there's some very good business impact metrics uh, on there as well. Yes, yeah, certainly we went, we made it quite far without going mentioning space, but <laughs> Dr. Nicole Boyd-Spring's work with both Dora and space yeah. are immeasurable here. And she is doing, please, if you're watching ever, I really want to interview you. I think one thing that we're not doing with business impact that or what platform teams often miss are connecting it with whole goals, which we know with door, we know is based with any goal with OKRs, especially we lack this top down messaging and view. So I know Spotify specifically, Helen, 
does it quite well. I learned from your colleague, Lauren, you start with, if you were doing the lagging value creation metric of like Spotify user satisfaction, which may be re retention, and then that would go down to time to recovery affects user retention, downtime, you know, things broken, we, we get distracted and go elsewhere or cancel our subscription. Then we know SRE team can really affect that. And then we go all the way to the leading actionable metrics that can affect the SRE's developer experience, which would be like latency of log ingestion. So you build up to support those OKRs. So what are some other ways, Helen, that you can measure business business impact with an organization? Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's what you said, Jen, on like this whole graph of like connecting like really high level business metrics all the way to individual teams building a specific tooling parts. Uh, but also, I think there's a lot to be said about like cost saving opportunities that platform teams bring. And maybe it's not the the prettiest of framings. It's not like maybe the sexiest of things you could be searching for. But it's really like an easy way to convince your stakeholders that like this team has gotten an ROI. And one clear examples of that could be like introducing standards and templates for people to do things as a, like as a means to streamline your workflow in the organization. And if you're just like really early on your platform journey and like looking for some quick wins, uh, some things that would convince your stakeholders that like platformization is a way to go, I would really recommend like standardization and templatization of your workflow, like quick boiler code to create to spin up a new service or to spin up a new data pipeline. It just like makes it such a, I don't know, irresistible argument as to why this is beneficial. So search for some quick wins and like solve for the, the biggest immediate problems of your organizations. And that would get your business on board with this whole idea. Yes, Paolo from the audience echoed that by saying, calculating the ROI in the right way is the key to success in convincing the business to invest in internal platforms. But on the other hand, Abby, are there, does it prevent risks or more problems or security flaws? That other, we haven't talked as much about that not unimportant, <laughs> that work that really developers is not helping them differentiate, but is really, when we say not unimportant, is actually really important. Yeah, I would definitely echo everything that both Alex and Helen said around cost optimization and, and the process and all those things, like everything, yes. One area where I've had success um, in a past job was to talk about risk. So we had a uh, fortnightly, so every two week release trains. And the idea was that we released every two weeks. And we didn't actually release every two weeks. We released almost daily because there were patches and fixes and you know, hot releases and all these things that were happening. And so the perception from leadership about what was happening in the business and technology and the reality was very different. And the risk to those big releases, the, the likelihood that those big every two week releases would fail was extremely high. And so I took a calendar of it was either a quarter or half of a year and i highlighted every day that we released in a different color depending on if it was successful if it and or or failed and i defined failed as needed a release immediately after it because we were supposed to be releasing only every two weeks uh or had an outage was like a different color if there was like an actual like we had an incident that caused by it. And it turned out that our uh, change fail rate was was not very uh, good. And we had huge risk about uh, cost towards our customer success team, supporting customers with these failures and um, cost to our engineering, debugging that. And so that was another place where we were able to show cost to the business being improved by improving our platform, by improving our delivery processes. So yeah, just another example. And all really important because I can't stress if engineering can't talk business and it's in the time of Gen AI and all, it's one of the most differentiating features is engineers need to be able to talk business and platform teams need to be able to talk business or else they get. So just as we're winding down, as your platform grows, as it matures, are there ways to measure your own and continuously improve. And Abby, I think you may have an open source CNCF maturity model you can 
provide there us may insight. have been this little thing that we did over the last nine months so uh <laughs> yes thank you jen uh a couple weeks ago about two three weeks ago the cncf platforms working group was very excited to uh release something that had been in the works since the beginning of the year which is a platform engineering maturity model that uh comes with about 12 pages i think of details so yes there's a table yes you can screenshot it but also yes there's a lot of context as to how all of this is very specific to your environment context is uh important as alex has said earlier um and this is hopefully going to help people at all levels of the organization so leadership understand what's possible and, and where they might need to invest to get there. Uh, but also, I'm hoping that it will support platform engineers who want, want to start that conversation to be able to point at something and say, this is where we are. Here's here are some examples from around the industry of the behaviors of where we are and the costs to that behavior. At our current scale as a company, I think it's worth us moving our maturity up a level. Uh, so please take a look. Uh, and we're always going to be keeping an eye on this. It's a, it's a growing space. And we expect that, that we will learn a lot over the next year as people put this to use even more. Uh, and we want to hear from you about how you do. Okay. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much, Anna. This was great. We really touched on a small amount of the topics because there was just so much more we could talk about. We will share links in the chat about different topics um, that you can continue le your learning. And if there's some place I think we all would agree, probably read the space framework. It's open source and it's really valuable and important. So thank you all. I'm going to call Claudio back to the stage. And thank you, listeners, of course. Thank you uh, for the panel. It's been, a, it's been really eye opening. Uh, so. I hope anyone, everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have. And thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Abby. And thank you, Anna, for your precious knowledge you shared with us today. See you all. Bye. <laughs>